You need to unmute Sister Eileen. You can, you are the co-host. You are using host. Not Eileen, huh? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. I can hear you now. Using Buddhist fellowship. I'm using Buddhist fellowship. Thank you, Brother Terence. Uh, good afternoon, yeah. Ajahn Brahmali. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi. Let's say three respects to Ajahn first before we start the session. First bow. Second bow. Musaga, please leave the door open. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All the way. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, so let's uh, carry on what we did yesterday. So I, I heard Ajahn Brahm was telling me this morning that he was making some jokes about the Kalama Sutta yesterday. So now I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to just say something about, <laughs> about that otherwise. So we kind of get ironed out any discrepancies or whatever you might, might call it. So uh, yesterday we had a look at the idea that uh, the Buddha always gives preference to uh, personal experience, uh, yeah, our understanding of the world, our experience of the world, which includes uh, insights, includes uh, deep meditation experience and all of these kind of things. Uh, this is what he gives priority to. And then he, uh, you know, he is initially, at least, that is what we should focus on here. And it's very interesting. And I think Ajahn Brahm, this was a point that Ajahn Brahm made, is that we are reading a sutta. And in that sutta, it says we should not read the suttas. Uh, yeah? <laughs> so it's, that is not exactly what it says. But that is what it looks like, it says. Uh, and uh, it is a very important point because it sounds like a contradiction. Yeah, How can you not take an interest in the suttas, in the uh, uh, tradition of Buddhism, etc. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and at the same time, we are using this particular sutta. It seems like a contradiction in terms. And it's one of those important problems in uh, uh, modern Buddhism. You see it around the world, especially among the uh, secular Buddhists. Uh, the secular Buddhist will say that it is okay to reject certain Buddhist teachings. Uh, and the reason it's okay is because of what it says in the Kalama Sutta. The Kalama Sutta says we can reject the traditions. Yeah? But uh, of course, what that means is that we also have to reject the Kalama Sutta itself. So then the advice itself becomes, uh, doesn't work. So then we get into a kind of a complicated paradox in a sense. And uh, so the whole thing stops working. So what is the way out of this paradox is one of those important questions. Uh, when it comes to the Kalama Sutta. And as always, when we deal with the suttas, uh, the word of the Buddha, the context in which those suttas are spoken is so important. It really matters what the context is. Uh, and this is what we have to understand in this case as well. If you understand the context, uh, then this uh, uh, seeming paradox, it uh, uh, resolves itself and there is no paradox anymore. Huh? And uh, that, uh, context is that the Buddha is traveling around India and is meeting all kinds of people who are, haven't really heard the Buddhist teachings before. They may be interested in spirituality in general, but they never really heard these kind of teachings. Yeah? So this is a teaching to new people, to newcomers to Buddhism. And when you are a newcomer, you need a way to decide if these teachings are good or bad. And that is the way to decide. The way to decide is then to look at your personal exper experience. Does that personal experience match with these teachings? And if there is a good match, then there is good grounds for uh, accepting this teaching. That's probably saying something interesting. Uh, yeah. And then uh, when you have taken that first step, uh, then gradually you build up and then you start reading the suttas more because you get inspired by them. Uh, you see that there's something beautiful going on with the suttas. You see something that uh, describes the human condition in the way that we probably all can recognize. Uh, yeah. This was one of those powerful things for me is that so much of the suttas, they describe what it is to be a human being yeah? and they describe it on a psychological level and in terms of, you know, the experiences that, ha that we have in life, a mixture of suffering and a mixture of happiness. Uh, it talks about how to deal with the mind, how to overcome 
defilements, how to think about the world in a skillful way. And when you put it all together, it gives, it's a recipe, it is a description of existence, which is very compelling and very powerful. And you get this feeling at the same time of there being a someone behind this sutta, someone who kind of had this overview, uh, this understanding, like a spiritual genius, yeah, uh, the Buddha, someone who has a special insight into the human condition. Gradually, this view starts to arise in you, uh, and this is this uh, confidence in this teaching. So, sometimes called faith, sometimes confidence. And as this grows, you can read more. You can use the logical deduction and then you experience more and the whole path grows together in this way. And that is the right way of thinking about this. Not to reject the suttas, but always to use it together with our experience of the world. That experience of the world will also include things like scientific findings. Yeah, we shouldn't really uh, in Buddhism, there's no need to reject science. Uh, there's no need to reject things like uh, uh, evolution. Uh, you know, Dar Darwinian, Darwinian evolution is perfectly compatible with the Buddhist teachings. Uh, there's no need to uh, reject things like the evolution of the universe or anything like that. Uh, uh, everything, all of these things basically fit in with the Buddhist narrative. And it should do. Yeah, it should be like that. It should do because we are searching for truth. This is what Buddhism is about. It's the yata bhuta jnana dasana, which is the Buddhist teachings, seeing and understanding things uh, in accordance with reality. Huh? And this is one of the things that makes the Buddhist teaching so powerful, that it is about truth. We should search for truth. And if there is a clash with one kind of truth, say the Buddhist truth clashes with the uh, scientific truth, then it needs to be resolved. Uh, yeah, it is not acceptable for us to reject truth. Uh, so we need to somehow re resolve that problem. Uh, and perhaps uh, we will find that there are certain suttas that are not authentic and there are certain ways of doing that. Uh, perhaps sometimes we will find, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the science is not mature enough yet. Scientific, you know, science also evolves. It takes time for science to understand certain things and the nature of the mind is one of those things that takes a long time for science to understand science doesn't really have a good understanding of the mind uh, so we, but all of these things should ultimately fit together and this, this is what this is pointing towards uh, so it looks like there is a problem in the sutta but if you read it in the right way uh, it actually comes together very nicely here uh. And one of the nice things about the sutta is that sometimes you do have little paradoxes. Yeah, you have things that seem to be contradictory that you have to resolve. And there are some of my favorite suttas have precisely that kind of something which looks paradoxical. But then when you look carefully, you realize it's actually just the, the Buddha's suttas that makes you look at life in a new way, that makes you understand and things in a new way. And this is the purpose of paradox. And the point, of course, is that the way that we tend to think about the world is not the way ordinary people see happiness, the Buddha sees suffering. And where the Buddha sees suffering, ordinary people, uh, see, or the way the Buddha seems, seeks happen, seems, see, uh, sees happiness, uh, ordinary people see suffering. So we have a tendency to understand the world upside down. And for that reason, paradox is sometimes useful to help us to approach that different world view that the Buddha presents, a different outlook, the different way of grasping this reality. So uh, having looked at the beginning of the Kalama Sutta, yeah, we never seem to get much beyond the beginning of the suttas. So everything sort of stops at the beginning. <laughs> And then it kind of, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get to make a bit more headway today. But you want to look a little bit at what the Buddha means when he says that we should go by experience and we should not go by uh, logic or uh, suttas, at least initially. What does it mean by this thing, experience? Uh, yeah, this is obviously a very important point. Uh, and you will see that what he is talking about is actually very obvious and it's something that we can all relate to it in a very simple way. So this is what the Buddha uh, says next, yeah? after saying that um, uh, uh, you should give them up when you know that they lead to harm and suffering. And then he says, what do you think, Kalamas? 
does greed come up in a person for their welfare or harm? Harm, sir. A greedy individual overcome by greed kills living creatures, steals, commits adultery, lies, and encourages others to do the same. Is that for their lasting harm and suffering? Yes, sir. Yeah, so that is the uh, uh, beginning of this uh, idea. Thank you for bringing up the suttas there, Eileen. That's marvelous. Uh, and we can now see what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is where the Buddha starts out. Yeah, he starts out by asking when you are greedy, yeah, is that for your happiness or for your suffering? Uh, and uh, it is, they say, for your suffering. They say here it is for the suffering. Uh, why? Well, because if you are greedy, then you tend to do immoral things. Immorality comes out of these defilements of the mind. Yeah, because of the defilements of the mind, that is why we do things that are immoral. And here you can see the immorality is phrased in terms of the first four of the five precepts. Yeah? So these are the first four of the five precepts that are mentioned here. And that is uh, the idea of immorality. But you can expand that. You can expand that to include all kinds of immorality, you know, harsh speech or divisive speech or uh, uh, whatever it is, or even things that are not included there. Yeah, things that you might, uh, uh, you can maybe add to that list if you wish, uh, even things like your views of the world or just internal anger and all of these kind of things uh, can be added to that list uh, but it comes from this word greed that is what drives this whole thing uh, and if you think about it uh, if you reflect on this idea you will know that whenever you do something that is not nice towards someone else yeah or towards an animal or towards whatever it is uh, why do you do that and you will find that it's almost always driven by your inter internal defilements this is what drives these uh, actions of ours. That is the real problem that we have to deal with. Yeah. So if you have greed or you have uh, desires, this is about the desires in regard to the sensory world, uh, the five senses that we're talking about here. Uh, and if it is, if you have desires uh, in regard to these things, that is where the breaches of these moral rule, uh, rules come out. Uh, Later on, uh, just afterwards, it talks also about anger and ill will. It talks about uh, confusion. Uh, uh, just afterwards. So these are also part of that uh, uh, defilements of the mind that drive uh, our uh, bad conduct in life and our uh, inability to live a moral life. So this is where the problem arises. Yeah. So really it comes back to the mind. It says you something about the mind. And again, reflect about it. If you are, you know, if you are the opposite, if you have no anger, if you have no greed, uh, if you have a beautiful sense of uh, kindness and compassion for the people and the world around you, if you feel very generous at heart, uh, you know, sometimes you just feel all this kindness inside of you. You feel like you want to share uh, positive things with the world. You want to kind of do something nice and you just have this positive energy inside of you. Yeah, I think we all have that sometimes. Uh, and when you have that kind of feeling, that is a feeling of the mind without defilements. And that feeling of the mind without defilements, you know yeah, from uh, within uh, that you will never do anything bad at that particular time. Uh, yeah, you know that that mind stops you from doing these things. So the defilements of the mind, the greed, the hatred, and the confusion, is always leads to the harm because they lead to the breach of the precepts. Uh, and you may be able to restrain yourself a little bit to hold back on the greed, hold back on the ill will. But in the long run, you won't be able to restrain yourself. In the long run, it will come out, yeah, because your mindfulness is not going to be good enough to always restrain yourself. So even if you have a reasonably good mindfulness, even if you restrain yourself somewhat, it will never be perfected. It will always be a problem. So greed is problematic. Yeah? And... Um, so here uh, we see the problem with greed, especially in regard to other people. Yeah, if you uh, are, if you do bad things towards uh, others, of course they will suffer. So it leads to the harm for uh, for others. Yeah, 
uh, and that is one part of it, that when we act immorally, it is bad for other people. But I think more important than the fact that it leads to other people's harm, it leads also to your harm. Yeah, When you do something that is bad and immoral, you also suffer as a consequence. And this is really the critical thing to understand. Because sometimes if it only has to do with other people, then sometimes we think, okay, the other person needs it, the other person deserves it, the other person needs to hear what I have to say, or they have done something bad, and I have to, we need to punish them, or we need to, you know, do something like that. But if you remember that it also leads to your own suffering, and your own problems, and your own harm, it becomes far more powerful incentive to actually deal with this. And this is what I would really recommend you to look at very carefully, is how these things lead to something bad inside, for, inside of yourself. And it is very obvious, and I, I love these simple teachings, and these are the things when the Buddha talks about the kamma that ripens in this very life, the ditta dhamma kamma, yeah, a very important concept in the Buddhist teachings. We often think about kamma as something that ripens in the future, but kamma also ripens in this very life. Uh, how does it ripen in this very life? And what I uh, really would recommend you is to try to see if you can uh, experience that in yourself, uh, how things ripen in your own life. Uh, yeah, See what happens when you do something which is not ideal, something which is perhaps a little bit not nice, yeah, you get take you, your, your ill will and anger, sometimes it kind of gets out of hand, and then we say something which is not the right thing to say to somebody. How does that feel to you afterwards, uh, especially when you understand that you haven't done quite the right thing here? And what you will notice that it tends to feel bad, yeah, it tends to have a negative consequence for you. Uh, and uh, the more we do of things that are bad, uh, the more we build up these negative feelings inside of us. Yeah? Every time we do something which is driven by a bad motive, by ill will or by too much greed, and you tell somebody off or you do something which isn't kind, uh, every time you do that, you build up the negative qualities in your own mind. It's like you're building up this uh, darkness, uh, the grayness, the uh, lack of happiness and contentment inside of you. Uh, do you want that mountain of darkness inside of you? And of course, the answer is no. So if you want to avoid building up these negative things, and, after, and the more they build up, the more your character becomes that kind of person. You become more like a dark individual. Yeah, And we can see that in the world. Sometimes you see people who are like taken over by the darkness of things, yeah, by the negative actions and all of that. Uh, and they seem like almost like ghosts in the human realm. Uh, and they are very problematic precisely because they live in a bad way. Uh. So if you understand how this affects you, uh, you become very careful. You become very concerned about not doing anything bad because you know how it affects you. Uh. You know that every time you do something which is wrong, you're taking one step backwards on the Buddhist path. You're making yourself less pure-hearted. You're destroying those good qualities inside of yourself. And you're moving backwards instead of moving forwards on this path. And this is when I said, talked about earlier about the idea of right view. Yeah, I was saying that right view is what distinguishes someone uh, or which is at the very beginning of the um, Noble Eightfold Path. And it also distinguishes someone who is able to meditate uh, from someone who is not. Uh, this is the sort of thing I was referring to, uh, understanding the consequences of these things, uh, understanding how they relate to your experience and your life, uh, and how it, you're dragging yourself down. You're being your own enemy if you fall for these things. Uh, and then your mindfulness at the back of your mind, you know what you have to do next. So mindfulness is... Uh, is interesting because you can be mindful of so many different things, but we need to direct the mindfulness to those things that are really important in our life so we can regulate ourselves. A lot of mindfulness courses will talk about the regulation of emotions. And of course, that is very important to be able to regulate our emotions. But also we need to regulate our responses to the world, regulate our responses to the people around us. And the more you understand how we let ourselves down by living immorally, the more powerful 
that becomes in your mind, the more clearly you see that, uh, the more obvious, the more clear your mindfulness is going to be on that. Uh, so whenever the problem arises, bang, you are mindful and you will deal with it in the right way. Uh. So this is uh, uh, mindfulness itself depends on these other factors uh, to become really strong and to become powerful and to be directed uh, in the right place uh, so that actually it has some kind of a uh, long-term effect on the spiritual path. Uh. And I love this idea, you know, of the Buddha, when the Buddha says that by when you are immoral, you are like your own enemy. Uh. Yeah, and do, the question is, do you want to be your own enemy or would you like to be your own friend? And the answer is obvious. We would like to be our own friend. Why would you not want to be your own friend? It is, you know, being friends with someone means you care for them. It means you look after them. So you learn to look after yourself in a way that actually works. And looking after yourself in a way that works is paradoxically to be kind to other people. Because when you are kind to other people, you will reap the benefits of that in the long run. So you are kind to yourself by being kind to others. And that is why the Buddha says, and this is one of those beautiful suttas in the Kosala Sangyutta, in the uh, Connected Discourse of the Buddha, the Buddha says that someone who acts immorally or acts badly towards another person, they are their own enemy. Why? Because you're creating suffering for yourself in the long run by acting badly towards other people. So be your own friend. Yeah, be your own. Uh, have, a, have an open heart to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Uh, understand the, uh, uh, the causes and the connections here. Uh, look into your own life. See what it feels like when you act towards others in the wrong way. Uh, and when you understand that, you will actually start to change your habits. Uh, and you will look in a different way. Uh, and you will start to become more firm in your morality not just morality, but in your kindness, yeah, in your generosity towards others, in your sense of compassion, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and we need more of that in this world. Uh, if every one of us can be a bit more kind and compassionate, wow, we are all making the world a better place. Uh, and we need that in this world. There's so much bad things happening in the world around us. There's also a lot of good things, uh, but uh, you know, sometimes if you read the news, you, you wonder what's going on in the world. And sometimes we need that kindness. So at least let us as Buddhists, let us be beacons of that kindness. Yeah, and then we will uh, maybe we will have an effect on the entire world around us as a consequence. So we need to overcome this uh, greed. Yeah, the greed is the root problem. We start by overcoming the uh, uh, by restraining ourselves and following the precepts uh, but then we understand that in the long run it is actually the greed itself that is problematic yeah. so you can see what is uh, happening here what is happening here is that we start off with the idea of right view the right view is the idea that morality is something positive in our lives it makes a life our lives more meaningful it makes our life more happy uh, we reduce the suffering and the problems out in our life. Morality is a very important part of our existence as human beings. Uh, that is the right view. Yeah? And then from that right view, we get the right intention. Uh, the right intention is then, okay, now I'm going to live more better. I'm going to live in the right way. Yeah? We have a more purpose. We have more meaning. We have a different kind of goal for our existence, uh, living in a better way. Uh, and then when that right intention comes in, then of course you start to act on that intention. You start to become a more moral person. Right speech, right action starts to happen. Yeah. And then this you can see how this whole this whole path kind of comes out of this. And this is why I was saying that what we are seeing here and what I'm looking at really is the noble eightfold path. This is how this unfolds. And all the suttas have very that kind of structure, yeah, the structure of the uh, path unfolding in a certain way. Yeah. So we, um, this is how it comes out. But ultimately, yeah, what you can also see here is that it is not enough to just be moral. You actually have to deal with the greed itself because the greed is the source here. The greed is what drives all of these other problems. Uh, so if you can deal with the greed, then you are dealing with all the problems in one go. Uh, so how can we deal with greed? And uh, the first thing to understand here is to understand that uh, 
Greed here is a very strong word in the English language. It means like you want all of these things. But uh, the Pali word loba, which is uh, behind this, it's, I don't think it is all that accurate to translate it as greed. What it means, it means all of those uh, desires that we have in the sensory realm, yeah? All the attachments that we have to the sensory world. Uh, that is really what it is referring to. Uh, and uh, that attachment that we have to the sensory world uh, is a very profound attachment. Uh, it is very profound because we live almost all our lives in the sensory world. Uh, yeah, everything you do from the moment you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night is in that sensory world. We see, we hear, we taste, uh, we uh, smell and we touch things and our whole world really evolves around that. Uh, and our identity, identity is also um, it is to some extent bound up with that world, yeah, in, with our relationships in that world, with the things that we own in that world, with our status within that world. So the sensory world is a very, it's almost everything that we have. And the spiritual world, which goes beyond that, for most people, it is only a very tiny part of their lives. So this is the right way to think about sensuality or the sensory world, yeah? So when we talk about greed and we talk about the sensory world, that is what we're talking about. So if we want to reduce our attachment to that world, it is very, it's almost all encompassing. Yeah, it is a very profound thing to do because what we are doing is that we are reducing our attachment almost to everything that we know. And all that is really left apart from that are some of the spiritual feelings that you may have from time to time. Yeah, the spiritual feelings of, kindness of sharing of generosity or maybe sometimes the spiritual feelings of uh, meditation practice the joy you get in meditation the peace you have in meditation and all of that uh, that is what remains uh, but uh, you are uh, starting to lose a little bit of that interest in the world uh, ordinary world around us uh, that is what it means to reduce greed in this particular context uh, so how can we do that uh, and there is a number of ways in which this can be done, but uh, I would recommend you to go very gently because if you don't go gently, it's gonna be very confronting. So you have to start in a very gentle way with how to deal with this. And uh, I don't usually recommend, you know, doing too much of the, you know, 31 parts of the body contemplation, that kind of stuff, because uh, sometimes that can be very uh, off-putting, especially if you uh, live an ordinary life, but more just to remember the drawbacks of that sensory world. What is the downside of the sensory world? Yeah, And one of the ways of doing that right now is, uh, you know, if you look, when I talk about the sensory world, we mean everything out there. Everything out there is an enormous world out there. And when you think about the world out there, everything beyond us, everything outside of us, yeah, you can see that there is vast amount of problems in that world. Uh, and we have seen it now through the COVID situation around the world. Uh, you see how much suffering it leads to in humanity. Yeah, when we have these kind of problems, uh, we can't do what we ordinarily want. We are restricted in so many ways. Uh, and people have all kinds of uh, psychological problems because of that. Uh, in the monastery, we have been very happy because of uh, uh, the COVID situation because it's been, you know, especially in the beginning, there was nobody coming to the monastery and it was just so peaceful and quiet. So we said, yay, COVID. <laughs> you know, we, so we were kind of saying that for, for monks and nuns, it's kind of the best possible situation and everything was really marvelous. But uh, most people don't think like that because uh, you have a different lifestyle. Eh? So it reminds you of what the world really is like. Yeah, yeah? nothing has gone wrong. COVID is part of the world. And of course, when this COVID is over, most people become stupid and they forget about COVID, but there's always another COVID lurking around the corner. And another COVID lurking around the corner is not necessarily an illness. It could be some other kind of big problem in the world. Yeah, it could be some other uh, issue which arises. And uh, you know, there are many problematic issues on the horizon. You can almost see them coming. Yeah, you can see all the political problems in the world. You see all the strange leaders, yeah, that are kind of rising everywhere. I don't know, I, I just find it very weird to see all these leaders around the world who do weird things and who seem to be very, 
like almost warmongering and all, you know, very hostile. And I, it's terrible when we have leaders like that because it affects every one of us when we have bad leaders. So that is kind of worrying, yeah. And then you have, of course, the uh, climate change and the climate situation. Uh, so what all of these things should do, they shouldn't really make you despair, they shouldn't make you depressed. If you use these, these things wisely, it will remind you of the downsides, uh, of, the, uh, of the problems with that world, uh, of the impermanence, of the way how it is always unreliable, how you can never know what is going to happen around the corner. Uh, it is so unreliable, that world. Uh, and when you understand the unreliability, unreli when you understand this is the way the world is, uh, it is not an aberration, nothing has gone wrong. This is the nature of this world. Uh, when you get that, it gives you an impetus to value the spiritual life more. You're starting to understand the world as the Buddha understood this world. This is how the Buddha understood the world. He understood in a very deep way how unreliable it actually is, how things can change just like that. And suddenly everything is upside down. And we forget that. When the times are good, when we are happy, when we're doing our things, when you all can come to Jhana Grove to come for the retreats, yeah, and you come down here and you can listen to Adam Brahma's wonderful stories and jokes and he can, you know, whatever it is that you do. And it's marvelous when we can do that. But it is so unreliable. unreliable. Suddenly you can't come to Australia anymore. Suddenly I can't even travel to Singapore and or Malaysia. Yeah, I can't because of this these things and that is the nature of this reality here and when you start to get this on a deep level you start to lose an interest in that entire sensory world that whole world of the um, outside there which is always going to let you down always be problematic yeah? and your interest in the things of the world in the statuses of the world in all of these things uh, you start to think enough of all of that because if i attach to this uh, I am going to suffer down the line. That is what you see here. So this is so beautiful, yeah, because it's so beautiful because it means that you can turn a difficult situation into something extremely positive. Huh? And once you start to live in the world in this way, you start to think about the world in this way, your values are starting to change. You are starting to get right view. The Noble Eightfold Path, the first factor is starting to get established you start to see that actually it is kindness it is the inner qualities of human beings it is the care that we have for others it is the compassion in our heart it is the wisdom that we carry with us that we use when we deal with others that is what matters that is what really uh, this life is about and when we live in that way then things really start to change and then the noble eightfold path starts to happen as a consequence so this is how I would recommend you to gradually overcome this idea we call the attachment to the external world, uh, reminding yourself of how uncertain it is. And I could say much, much more about that because that uncertainty in the external world, it is so uh, all encompassing. Yeah, it has to do with the very personal, uh, our personal lives, with the, our loved ones and everything. All of that is unreliable, all of that is uncertain. Uh, and it's kind of terrible when you first hear about it, uh, but after a while, the penny starts to drop and you start to change your values. Uh, you start to look at the world in a new way. You think more like the Buddha. You think more like Ajahn Brahm. And then now you start to understand why it is that Ajahn Brahm is able to meditate so easily. Uh, why Ajahn Brahm, he just relaxes, he just chills. Uh, he closes his eyes and kind of bang, everything just happens. Uh, that is why he does that, because he understands in a very deep way how unsatisfactory that world is and how happy the world of the mind is and how controllable the world of the mind is, because it is inside each one of us. It is not subject to the same kind of law of impermanence as the external things. It is still subject to impermanence, but in a different way from the world outside. Anyway, that is just to give you some idea idea of the uh, how the Buddha is talking about this yeah what he means by these things uh, here in the Kalama Sutta and I'm, of course I like to take the opportunity to expand on these things uh, quite a bit because these are very 
powerful and beautiful teachings. Uh, and if you do think about them in the right way, this is how I like to think about right view, because it is very practical. It is very pragmatic. We can use it right here and right now, given the situation in the world. Uh, and it starts to have a, a, a very strong impact uh, on who you are, how you think, and how you, how you actually live your life. Uh, so then, having said this about greed, uh, the Buddha says the same thing about, uh, uh, what is it, about uh, anger, yeah, about um, uh, anger and then confusion. So these are then the second and the third of these underlying uh, defilements of the mind that he talks about, and exactly the same thing that he talks about with his other defilements. So if you are angry or you are confused, yeah, is that for your welfare or for your harm? And of course, the Kalamas, they are very beautiful, and they say these things are for your harm. Why are they for your harm? Because they lead to you uh, breaching of the laws or the rules of morality. Yeah, you steal, you kill, and all of these kind of things, just as you do with greed. Yeah, so the same problem. The defilements are what makes us do these things. When you are confused, you don't really know what you're doing, and sometimes you do unskillful things as a consequence. So the same ideas behind this. And I'm not going to go into uh, much more detail now, even though. Uh, you, you, we could that because there's much more to be said about this, uh, but let's leave it uh, at that for now. Uh, and uh, then uh, the Buddha says to the Kalamas, what do you think, uh, Kalamas? Uh, are these things skillful or unskillful? Uh, unskillful, sir, they say very beautifully. Yeah. Uh, are they blameworthy or blameless? Uh, blameworthy, sir. Uh, are they criticized or praised by sensible people? They are criticized by sensible people, sir. So uh, here you have all these different ways in which we uh, think about, uh, can think about this, yeah? Uh, so just to kind of drive home the point that this is uh, unfortunate and these things are uh, counterproductive. They are unskillful, yeah? They are unskillful in the sense that they are harmful. Uh, and they lead to our harm and they are unskillful in the sense that uh, it clouds our judgment, it makes us unable to live in a, in a good way and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, they are blameworthy. Yes, yeah? so one of those interesting things is that if other people see us do bad things, then those people who are wise in the world, they will criticize you, yeah? They will blame you, they are blameworthy things. Uh, and if we are wise, we will also tend to criticize ourselves uh, for doing these things. So we become like we uh, self-reproach, uh, where you criticize yourself and you feel bad about yourself uh, as well. Uh, and then you have this last one, which is this very interesting idea. It says that it is uh, criticized by the wise. Uh, yeah, wise people criticize you uh, if you do these things. And um, uh, which is uh, kind of fascinating because uh, earlier on, uh, when we read out the reasons we should not follow things, is that you should not follow things just because someone is your teacher or someone is like a good speaker. That is not enough reason to follow uh, that person's advice. We should do it only when we know things for yourself. Yeah. And now the Buddha says we should follow the wise people. <laughs> so you can see there is like little paradoxes here throughout the suttas. On the one hand, we should be careful with just following the teachers. But on the other hand, we should follow what wise people say. Yeah. So uh, there is a, again, there is this sense of, uh, you know, of we have to be very uh, careful how we judge this and how we look at these paradoxes. Uh, and the idea is that, of course, here, if we feel, if we have uh, strong faculties ourselves, uh, if we have the ability to look at people and to distinguish who is really wise in this world and who is not, yeah, if we understand that immoral people are not wise, if we understand that people who have a lot of metta and kindness, that they tend to be wise, if we, have, if we are skilled ourselves and we are smart about this, yeah, then we are actually able to distinguish between the wise people in the world and the unwise people. Then we can follow the advice. So, but be careful, yeah, I mean, be very careful. It can be very difficult to distinguish between the wise people and the unwise people. 
don't jump to conclusions too quickly and be very careful with how you think about these things. It is so easy to get these things the wrong way around. And then if you get it the wrong way around, then, you know, it just doesn't work out. And then you kind of, you are uh, down the line, you are really disappointed because the person you thought was wise turns out to be a dodgy character and all of that kind of thing. So may you never have those such dodgy character in, characters in your life. May you always have the truly wise people that you follow in your life. And uh, so, but be careful, don't just follow the crowd, yeah? Because so many people in the world, they are crowd followers and you will hear arguments like, you know, for example, if you are, if people are Christians, they will say, oh, oh but there are so many Christians in the world, right? So how can they all be wrong here? Yeah? And, uh, you know, the answer to that question is, well, that is precisely why they are probably wrong, because there are so many of them, yeah? Because we know that the average person is not going to be very wise. The average person is usually get things wrong. If the average person was wise and the average person uh, got things right, there wouldn't be any suffering in the world. Uh, the fact there is there's so much suffering in the world means that the average person tends to get things wise. So that is the, a really bad argument that everyone thinks this, therefore you should think so too. No, that is exactly why you should not think so. And you should also be careful in Buddhism as well. I, this is not just about this. I'm not really kind of arguing against Christianity specifically. This is always true. Yeah, it is also true in Buddhism. Sometimes you will hear people say, oh, this is Arahant, yeah, everybody else thinks so, therefore you too should think so. No, if everyone thinks so, then there is grounds for being skeptical. You should always uh, come value things. Uh, you should value your own ability to judge these things. Uh, you should never just follow the crowd, just be a sheep and just follow along. If you do that, uh, you are guaranteed to be disappointed down the track. Trust yourself, uh, trust your ability to make distinctions. Uh, but be humble at the same time. Don't come to quick judgments, yeah? And don't follow the crowd. Don't follow what I say, yeah? Just forget what I say and then come to your own judgment instead. And then you are gonna be on the right track, yeah? So we have to be self-reliant in a certain way. Otherwise, it doesn't gonna, it's not gonna work out. And then you can start to judge that people are wiser. Yeah, and uh, this is how I have come to the conclusion that the Buddha is really wise, yeah, it is very hard to find any more wise than the Buddha, he's kind of the top of the apex, he's, you know, he's kind of the very top of the pyramid. This is why I have come to the conclusion that some of the uh, monks that I know really well also have a lot of, lot of wisdom. Uh, people like uh, Ajahn Brahm is one of my favorite monks, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be living here for so long. Uh, but there's many more than Ajahn Brahm, there's many monks who live all of, or, or everywhere around the world. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite monks who I visited quite recently is uh, the monk Ajahn Ganha in Thailand, uh, this beautiful Thai monk who has just this enormous amount of metta and peace and all of these marvelous qualities. Uh, uh, when you're with him, it's kind of hard to understand how someone can have, can radiate so much positive qualities. Uh, and these are the things that give you a sense of, uh, you know, the sense of, uh, 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 of uh, wisdom in the world, of uh, something special going on. Uh, because if pe people can be like that, uh, you know that there's something special going on. Uh. Anyway, so sensible people, yeah? And uh, so it is criticized by sensible people. So if then you, you start to listen a bit more, if it is criticized by dodgy people, you don't really care so much, yeah? All the dodgy people, whatever they say is kind of irrelevant, yeah? And then the Buddha asks again, when you undertake these bad things, do they lead to harm and suffering? When you undertake them, they lead to harm and suffering. That is how we see it. We can see how the Buddha is leading and to see things from his point of view. He's very, very skilled here, but using their personal experience yeah, to kind of help them along. Yeah. So Kalamas, when I said, don't go by oral tradition, don't go by all of these things, by lineage, by testament, by canonical authority, don't rely on logic, don't rely on inference, don't go by reason, 
uh, contemplation. Don't go by acceptance of a view after consideration. Don't go by the appearance of competence. Uh, and don't think the ascetic is our respected teacher. Uh, but when you know for yourself these things are unskillful, these things are blameworthy, they are criticized by sensible people, uh, and when you undertake them, they lead to harm and suffering, then you should give them up. That is what I said. So, there you are. So this is uh, uh, how the Buddha, so uh, uh, this is very, again, very, very beautiful, yeah? And you can kind of feel for yourself whether you are living in the right way to see how it affects you on the path when you practice. Uh, does it, is it beneficial what you're doing? Is it leading you in the right direction? Or are you overdoing things a bit too much? Are you suppressing things perhaps or repressing th things? Or are, you, or are you doing things in a way that actually has a benefit in the long run? This is uh, what you should be looking at. Uh, so now we come to the other side of the co coin. And uh, the Buddha says, what do you think, Kalamas? Uh, does contentment come up in the person for their welfare or for their harm? For their welfare, sir. An individual who is content, not overcome by greed, doesn't kill a living creature, doesn't steal or commit adultery, doesn't lie or encourage others to do the same. Is that for their lasting welfare and happiness? Yes, sir. So when you are content, yeah, when you are happy with the things in the world, when you understand the limitations of the world, uh, and when you're just happy with it inside of yourself, and you have a sense of loving kindness for the people around you, how do you act? Uh, you act with kindness. Uh, you don't do these things that drag you down the drain uh, and lead you in the wrong direction. Uh, and what is also interesting about what the Buddha says here, he says also this has this idea of uh, you encourage others to do the same, yeah? Uh, and it had the reverse before, you encourage others to do bad things, but here you encourage others to do good things. Uh, and this is part of the morality of the Buddhist path, uh, is that we encourage others uh, to live in the right way. Uh, yeah, this is kind of uh, what my life is like as a Buddhist monk. I, you know, this is what kind of being here and giving talks is about, is about encouraging people to live in a good way. So such a wonderful existence to be a Buddhist monk because all you do is good things. Yeah, you're always kind of uh, uh, hopefully living in the right way and hopefully encouraging others. It's just a marvelous existence. And we can all do that to some extent, yeah? Reminding others of the importance of these things, uh, part of the idea of sila in Buddhism. So, um, and then he says the same thing for uh, the other uh, the other defilements, yeah, what do you think, Kalamas? When love comes up in a person, is it for their welfare or harm? So this is now the non-anger, yeah, the love or the compassion. And then when clarity comes up in the person, it's the opposite of uh, confusion. Uh, is it for their welfare or for their harm? And again, you don't uh, breach any morality rules when these things come up because you just want to be kind. Uh, and then the Buddha carries on. I'm going to do it a bit shorter now. Uh, what do you think, Kalamas? Are these things skillful or unskillful? Uh, they are skillful. Uh, are they blameworthy or blameless? Uh, they are blameless, sir. Uh, criticized or praised by sensible people. Praised by sensible people. Uh, when you undertake them, do they lead to welfare and happiness or not? Uh, or how do you see this? Uh, when you undertake them, they lead to welfare and happiness. Uh, that is how we see it. Yeah, when you have the good qualities in your heart, it always has good consequences. When you act on those, you are like your own friend because it leads to your own happiness in the long run. This is the power of this. And so, Kalamas, when I said, don't go by oral transmission, don't go by all of these things, but when you know for yourselves, these things are skillful, uh, blameless, praised by sensible people, etc., then that you should keep them, acquire them, and, and, uh, and practice them. That is what I said, and that is why I said it. So, uh, yeah, 
so uh, there you are. If you wish, you can uh, contemplate that sutta a bit more, if you like, on your own. But I will, I will uh, leave it at that because uh, I think otherwise we're going to be going too long. And then, when the Buddha has spoken about these things, yeah, remember again that we are talking here about really uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. So the Buddha has talked about uh, the idea of morality. He's also been talking really about greed and anger and confusion, which are about the mental defilement. Uh, and that has to do with uh, uh, right effort uh, on the Eightfold Path. Yeah? So he has been talking about the first eight, six factors now of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, he talks about uh, the last two factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. So the whole Noble Eightfold Path is actually included in this uh, Kalama Sutta, which is really fascinating. Yeah, when you read it, it may not be obvious to you that that actually is the case, but actually it is an is a, a unusual exposition of the Noble Eightfold Path. So at the very end here, the Buddha says, then that noble disciple is rid of desire, rid of ill will, unconfused, aware, yeah, sati, mindful, so this is uh, aware here is uh, probably, I haven't got the Pali here, but I think it probably is uh, uh, like Sampajano or something like that and mindful. Yeah. So now you have Sati. This is how Sati really becomes strong and really arises. And then when that Sati and that awareness is strong, then they meditate, spreading a heart full of love uh, to one direction, to the second direction and the third and the fourth. In the same way, above, below, across, and everywhere, all around, they spread a heart full of love to the whole world, abundant, expansive, limitless, free of enmity and ill will. And um, then the sutta continues with the same thing for uh, compassion and the same thing for uh, uh, mudita for the altruistic joy and the same thing also for the upeka the four brahma viharas yeah so you can see here founded on that sila founded on the purity of the mind that you already have that is when you start your meditation practice uh, and that is when it enables you to spread the metta and spread this beautiful mind state so the whole world as a consequence uh, and this is then how the meditation comes about uh, he could also have put the breath meditation in there. He could have put the Satipatthana meditation in there. All of these things are roughly equivalent because when you get to this point, you have the ability to meditate on almost any topic. Yeah, And uh, also implied in this is the Samadhi experience because when you practice metta in this way and you purify the mind in a very deep sense, then the Samadhi also arises out of that. This is how Samadhi happens. Coming out of the happiness, coming out of the joy of the Brahma Viharas. That is how they actually arise. And in this way, the whole Eightfold Path is actually part of this. So um, that is this uh, marvelous uh, Kalama Sutta. And uh, I probably haven't really taught it in as much detail or as well as I should have. And I apologize for that, but uh, the retreat is only so long and we only have so many sessions. So we have to kind of, we should do a little bit more than the Kalama Sutta. So um, anyway, so, but you can uh, reflect a little bit on your own uh, about that Sutta and then see what you uh, come, uh, what that, where that brings you. But before I uh, call it, before we stop and before we have a meditation together, let me just uh, uh, maybe read out a couple of more little suttas here, because uh, these are also very uh, beautiful suttas, and it's nice to kind of to uh, add uh, to what we have been doing a little bit, I think. And um, these are, these suttas are verses. Uh, these are verses found in some very, what I think very inspiring and, and uh, interesting parts of the Pali Canon. These are verses that you probably have never heard before. Uh, yeah, because these are not very often uh, taught. Uh, but uh, if you are interested in these kind of verses, and I, I must admit, I find more and more verses can be very inspiring uh, because there comes a point when you know enough of the Dhamma 
and I know that some of you, you are really, uh, you are, you, you know the Dhamma really, really well. And sometimes all you need is to be inspired to do the right thing, to live in the right way. And sometimes these verses have that inspirational quality, yeah, whereby they uh, give you that feeling, yeah, I got to do the right thing, and I have to practice in the right way. Yeah? And uh, so this first little verse here that I have included here is from the uh, connected discourses of the Buddha, the Sangyuta Nikaya. This is from the Devata Sangyuta, which is the first uh, chapter of connected discourses. Uh, and this is the first of those suttas. And uh, this first sutta, this is what it sounds like. It's just one verse. Yeah? It's a very, very short one. And this is how it uh, reads. This is the Buddha speaking. Yeah? The Buddha says, uh, one should associate only with the good. With the good, one should foster intimacy. Having learned the true Dhamma of the good, one is released from all suffering. So very short, yeah, very kind of pithy little teaching by the Buddha and uh, very simple, but uh, it is also actually a very powerful statement that says a lot about the Dhamma and how the Dhamma actually works. So the good here, who are the good that we should associate with? And very often in Buddhism, the good are the Saparisa or the Aryans, the noble people in the world, those people who have understood the Dhamma, who you know, carry the Dhamma, around with them as part of their psychology and around them in their heart uh, because they've understood what these teachings are about. Uh, so it's good to hang out with such good people, yeah, the people who are special, who have special qualities. Uh, so this is the first one. And of course, that would be the Buddha. So it's good to hang out with the Buddha a little bit. Uh, and it may also be other people who you, through your experience, you know, have special qualities, yeah, who have a lot of kindness and metta and have all of these qualities deeply inside of them and are wise in a certain way. So these are, this is where we start out. Yeah, we should hang out with these good people. That's what it says here, associate with them. You should foster intimacy with them. Yeah, you should be with them a lot if you can. And then what happens if you do that? And this is kind of what is so interesting here. It is so interesting because it sounds almost too easy to be true. Having learned the good the Dhamma, the true Dhamma is the Sadhamma. This is the uh, Dhamma of the Buddhas and the Dhamma of anyone who understands their teachings. Uh, having learned that Dhamma, yeah, you are released from suffering here. That's all you have to do. Yeah, all you have to do is to kind of hang out with the nice people in the world, uh, learn the Dhamma from those nice people, uh, and then you are released from suffering as a consequence. Uh, is that marvelous? Uh, there's something very it's almost too easy, yeah? almost too easy to be true. How can you just hang out with the good people and you are released from all suffering? But that is, in a sense, what the Buddha is saying here. Huh? And it is, again, this very simple teaching. And when you read it, you may think, this is an exaggeration. It can't possibly be true. How can you just hang out with good people and you are released from suffering? I don't believe it. Yeah, Buddhism must be false. This is too simple. Can't be like this. But uh, remember, we have just been looking at the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Noble Eightfold Path starts out with right view. Where does that right view come from? That right view comes from the noble people. It comes from those people who have seen reality as, as it actually is. It comes from the Buddha. It comes from the noble ones. It comes from the Saparisa. That is where it comes from. And if you don't connect with other good people, then you have to rely on your own biases, your own limited right view. You may, there may be parts of you which has a little bit of right view, but there's also going to be parts of an ordinary person which is not right. And to that extent, we do depend on seeing things in the right way. So to be able to have right view, to be able to get the Noble Eightfold Path, even to start, yeah, the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path, you need these saparisas, you need these noble ones in your life to point you in the right direction, to give you the right values, to show you the importance of kindness and why this really matters, and then gradually move you forward on the Noble Eightfold Path. 
So this is the first point. Without that, there is no starting point. Uh, but the other thing which is so interesting about this is that uh, you will have noticed in your own life that uh, once you hear these Dhamma teachings, uh, there is something very compelling about it. Uh, there's something which, once you hear it, you want to do these things. Yeah, That is why you are coming to this retreat now, why you're listening to these talks. Uh, that is why many of you are practicing the five precepts in daily life. Uh, that is why you uh, regularly come on meditation retreats, because you understand that there's something to be done here. Otherwise, you wouldn't come on these things. Uh, and whether you realize it or not, that is actually what is happening here. Yeah. So what the Buddha is saying is that once you have that right view, these other things just happen as a matter of course. You gradually, you get into these things. Gradually, your intention, your values, your, uh, your, the way that you look at the world, there's a beautiful German world called, word called Weltanschauung, which means like the outlook that we have. All of these things change, and you start to think about the world in a different way. That is your intention starting to align with the intention of the Buddha then the morality comes, and then the, eventually the meditation, everything happens as a consequence. Yeah, so what the Buddha is saying is the power of listening to the real Dhamma, the power of hanging out with the right people, the power of trying to understand what these people are saying, the power of trying to enter the word of the Buddha, not just hearing it, but reflecting on it, entering it, seeing how it applies to your own life, not just thinking of the word of the Buddha as some kind of ancient teaching that applied two and a half thousand years ago, but seeing it as something that actually applies to your life, my life, all of our lives here and now in this very day and age, then it starts to become powerful. And then it leads you stage by stage all the way to the end of suffering itself. So, um, that is that uh, beautiful little verse on uh, the importance of the uh, foundations of the uh, spiritual life and how that kind of, again, it fits with the idea of right view. Yeah, because this is how right view arises. And there are so many ways in which this is actually uh, taught in the suttas. And this is one of these ways. And it kind of uh, caught my eye when I was reading the suttas the other day, and I kind of thought, wow, that's, a, that's very beautiful, and it's very simple, uh, and it's very useful to uh, be reminded of these very simple teachings. Uh, so let us uh, stop there for today, and let us uh, uh, leave the suttas uh, for, uh, for, for today, and we'll come back to more uh, suttas tomorrow, and uh, we will, hopefully, you are enjoying this. Uh, if you're not enjoying it, you can complain to Ajahn Brahm and tell Ajahn Brahm that uh, I'm going too slow or I'm going too fast. Uh, I know, I, al I already know that I speak too fast. Everyone says that. Uh, so I apologize for that. And I, I'm hopefully, hopefully you're getting used to the way I speak uh, after a while. <laughs> but uh, now let's do some meditation together because that is what this is all about uh, and see if we can allow these teachings to inspire us a little bit uh, also in our meditation practice. So, Okay, everyone, so make sure that you, as always, you uh, start out in the right way. If you start out in the right way, then everything tends to happen as a consequence. So make sure that you take a bit of time by closing your eyes and then feeling your body, making sure that you are comfortable. Uh, I would recommend you when you listen to the talks to sit in one posture and then change the posture for meditation. In other words, sit on a chair perhaps during the talk. And then if you want to sit cross-legged, do that only for the meditation. Otherwise, uh, uh, it will be, may become too strenuous for your body. You know? Or you can also sit on a chair during your meditation practice. Uh, it doesn't matter. Whatever makes you feel at ease. That is the critical thing. So you can really relax, really be kind to yourself, really care for yourself, make sure that you 
are, you know, you are your own best friend, as the Buddha says, not your own enemy, making yourself feel tense and tight, but allowing yourself to relax, allowing yourself to just be, your, be who you are, self-acceptance, not kind of pushing yourself around too much. So take that time at the beginning and just uh, relax, allow things to be, allow the world to be, and just be patient as you allow things to calm down. And uh, as you do this, uh, please remember not to do your meditation. Uh, meditation is the opposite of doing. Uh, in fact, please forget about the word meditation, uh, because the moment you think meditation, usually you think there's a certain thing that you have to do. Uh, you have to sit in a certain posture. You have to watch your breath. Uh, you have to be mindful. Uh, but please don't think like that, because the moment you think what you have to do, then you are already on the wrong track. The idea of meditation is just to relax. The idea is to allow the meditation to happen without you doing anything. And to do this is so important to give rise to the right kind of perception. And as I mentioned yesterday, one way of doing this is to reflect what it is like when you come back home after a long day at work and you feel tired and you just sit down. When you do that, what do you do at that time? And what you do at that time is really nothing. You don't think when you are tired, oh, I must be mindful. You don't think, I must think like this, I must not think like that. When you're tired and you're sitting down to relax, you just allow your mind to go. And this is what we should be doing in our meditation practice, just allowing the mind to go. And as we allow the mind to go, gradually it finds its own equilibrium. And it finds that equilibrium because we are programmed to look for the right things. The right view, which comes at the beginning, directs the mind all by itself. And there is nothing that we have to do about it.
And uh, as you do this, uh, you know that you are on the right track. If you don't have any tensions or any tightness in the body, uh, the body should feel really, really relaxed. Uh, that is how you know you are on the right track. Uh, if you are not really relaxed, uh, it means that your mind is still controlling the body. Uh, it means that you're not really letting go properly. Uh, and you need to come back to this idea of just sitting there or just being with your mind as if you are resting in your favorite armchair or chair and just relaxing and just being without doing anything at all. So come back to this very simple thing here, having no ideas about what you are really doing except relaxing, allowing things to be, being kind to yourself, stop controlling who you should be.
And uh, please don't be discouraged uh, if you find that your mind does not really cooperate. Uh, please don't be discouraged if you find yourself being tired. Uh, don't be discouraged if you find your mind thinking a lot. Uh, these are problems that almost everyone has every now and again. Uh, and even if you have a lot of it, uh, still don't be discouraged. Uh, and the reason why these things are happening uh, is because either you are just tired and you need a bit of rest, uh, in which case you should allow yourself to be tired. Uh, or they are happening because you are valuing the wrong things. Uh, if you think about the world, you think about your family, you think about your job, you think about these problems, uh, it's because you are valuing these things. Uh, but instead, uh, remind yourself of the uncertainty of that world. Uh, remind yourself of the beauty of the peace and the joy of meditation instead. Uh, and lead your mind towards real happiness, uh, gently by understanding the idea of right view, uh, of right value, uh, of what really matters in the world. Uh, and if you do it in this way, it is marvelous how the mind tends towards that peace. Uh, it does take training, uh, but uh, it is uh, the right way of approaching meditation practice. Uh.
And uh, if your meditation is going reasonably well, uh, and there will be times when you have a sense of clarity and peace in your mind, uh, then uh, uh, make sure not to focus too hard on the breath at those times. Uh, I think often people make the mistake of focusing too hard on the breath. Uh, and the moment you focus too hard with too much force and willpower, you start to tense up again. Uh, so instead of focusing in that way, focus on the peace. Uh, focus on the enjoyment that is there, just being peaceful by yourself. Uh, and then leave the breath in the background. Uh, the breath is always with us. Uh, the breath is always around the corner. Uh, but don't focus it on it directly here, uh, because if you do, it often leads to tension and problems. Uh, stay instead with the beautiful part of the experience, uh, the peace, uh, the enjoyment that you have. Uh, and the breath is like a secondary experience at the same time. Uh, and then uh, hopefully you can bypass the problems of feeling uh, or not really being 100% at ease. Uh,
And uh, as your meditation comes along, uh, make sure that you keep on monitoring your progress as you do so. And make sure that you don't fall back into the traps of tension and tightness in the body. Uh, because if you do, you are already heading in the wrong direction. Uh, you should be at ease. Uh, it should be enjoyable. Uh, so then take a few steps back uh, and ask yourself how you can relax more into the meditation practice. Uh, but if you are moving in the right direction, uh, you find yourself that you are at ease, you are enjoying what you're doing, uh, then you just have to use your perception uh, to see what you are doing in the right way. Uh, enjoy it, uh, take delight in what is happening. Uh, and if you are uh, enjoying the watching of the breath, uh, remember that the breath is like a friend, uh, this beautiful friend who has always been there, this beautiful friend who is taking you on this marvelous adventure of meditation practice. Uh,
Okay, everyone. So uh, coming close to the end once again, uh, and I would recommend you as always, before to the end, uh, just to review very briefly your meditation practice. Uh, what are the things that worked in the meditation? Uh, if you feel more relaxed, more at ease, more mindful now than when you started out, uh, why is that the case? Uh, what are the perceptions that you have developed? Uh, how does the process of letting go actually happen? Uh, Okay, everyone, that is the meditation for now. So uh, I wish you all well. Uh, please continue enjoying your retreat uh, and we'll see you back again tomorrow at three o'clock. Thank you so much, Ajahn. Okay. See you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>